Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Like I said, if people come in, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, so my name is Anthony Rodriguez. I'm a certified professional dog trainer uh, with CCPDT. That's the organization. And um, I'm a trainer with Love Them, Train Them. Right? I have a, uh, she'll be 10 this year, uh, Pitbull Weimaraner mix named Molly. Uh, you'll see her throughout the presentation. She struggled real bad with leash walking and still is a challenge, right? Uh, leash walking is a very um, challenging thing. It can be very frustrating for us, very frustrating for the dogs. Uh, but when we started our life together, Molly and I, I had her pull me on a skateboard pull me to the mailbox, pull me down the street, right? So uh, I wanna start this whole thing by saying I've been where you're at, right? Uh, and maybe you're not there and that's great too, but you're gonna get a lot of information to help you either with your, your dog you have now uh, or a future dog. But um, we didn't do any training, you know, um, until she was six years old. So that's a lot of time to practice those behaviors, right? Um, so once we started doing training, uh, it's not a quick fix, you know, and we'll go into the nuts and bolts of leash walking, but over time you start to see progress, right? And my goal throughout this presentation is to highlight those things, those little small wins, those uh, progress points that you can make and recognize so that way your confidence can still be progressing upward versus getting frustrated or down on yourself or upset because at the end of the day, a walk with your dog, and I apologize because it's a beautiful day and I wish we could all be out there doing this presentation, right? But um, uh, I, wanna, I want this to be a good experience with your dog, right? That's what leash walking is for. It's to, to have an outing where you can bond, where you can experience your environment, not go out and come back 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, and be completely frustrated, right? That's the opposite of what we want. Yes, come on in, come on in. We're just right at the beginning, so you're perfect. Um, but the idea being, we don't want leash walking to be frustrating for you or for your dog, you know? If you find that you're coming home from your walks and you're just over it, right? Think about, is the walk even beneficial for you guys, okay? Um, I, wanna, I want you to know that there are other options out there besides leash walking, uh, but just know that if we can find those small little wins, those small little confidence boosters, it's really gonna boost our morale and say, all right, we're, good, we're doing a little better, you know? And knowing that can be really comforting uh, and recognizing that progress that you're making is gonna be really important, okay? So some of the things we're gonna cover today, we're gonna cover the mindset and theory before you go on a walk, okay? How to prep yourself. Uh, some expectations from the walk that are healthy, okay? Understanding how dogs think and how they see their, env their environment. Some of the gear that will help or potentially hurt your situation, okay? Uh, not all gear is a cure-all. And we'll go into it in a little bit. And I have some stuff here for you to check out at the end. But the idea is, is how to set ourselves up for success too, you know, before we go on a walk. So there'll be some tips as far as what you can do beforehand, some techniques to influence good leash walking behavior. Okay, then we'll get into the actual walking, what to do when they pull ahead, how to walk with them nicely, how to reinforce good behaviors. Um, all the techniques and things I'm going to teach you is all positive reinforcement, you know, so we're never going to be jerking the leash or yelling at them or scolding them, but instead we're going to reinforce behaviors we like, which if you hear me say reinforce, simply that means we're going to reward them in some way. Petting and praise is great, treats are great, uh, but we want their confidence to go up as we learn too, right? We don't ever want them to get frustrated. Uh, because again, if, if they get frustrated or if they get to the point of frustration, we have to say to ourselves, is this even worth doing, right? But it is worth doing, and I'm going to show you how. Okay, we'll also talk about some issues. So if you have questions, we'll save them to the end because I may address them at that point. Um, and we'll talk about some common things that happens. Uh, also, off-leash situations. I, I put it at the end because I could talk for two hours about off-leash stuff. Uh, and then we'll have questions, all right? Okay, so getting started about the mindset, okay? What to think about before you get started leash walking. A question I like to ask myself and ask my clients and students is, who is this walk for, okay? Is it for us? Are we trying to get exercise, right? Or the other side, is it for our dog to get enrichment, 
right? To get stimulation from their environment, to get out of the house, right? Now that could be for us too. Hello. Hi. Come on in. That's okay. That's all right. So uh, as far as what the purpose of this walk is, okay, uh, think about enrichment versus exercise, okay? Oftentimes uh, we may think we want to walk our dog because we want them to get tired so we can cook, clean, do work, whatever it may be, just watch TV in peace and quiet, right? Because we just got home from work. But that result can still be achieved through an enrichment-based walk versus we have to cover a lot of distance, okay? If you think about a walk as far as distance goes, okay, let's say you live in a cul-de-sac or you live in a neighborhood and, and your goal for a walk is to do three laps, right, around your neighborhood, um, so that way it tires them out, okay? If we think about it that way and our dog is pulling or trying to go smell something or interact with something else for three laps or after the first lap, how frustrating is that? Right? It's putting ourselves in a box that is hard to mentally get out of, to see the good part in, in the leash walking. So I try to encourage people as far as who the walk is for and how to go into the walk. Think about it as enrichment. Okay? And also, hello, uh, we may need another chair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, give me one second. Let me go ask them real quick for a chair. Hello, I'm not here. Well, you're more than welcome to use this. There's also some chairs uh, in the room behind us as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, getting back into how we can set ourselves up for success as far as walking goes, right? Uh, I tell people again, think about enrichment versus exercise, okay? It gives us a little bit more leeway as far as what our dog's able to do and our stress level can start to decrease if we have that expectation. Also, giving yourself a time limit for the walk versus a distance goal. I like to tell people if you have 30 minutes for your walk, think about it in those terms, okay? Think, all right, we got 30 minutes to go and come back. Uh, about halfway in that time, we can start our, you know, walk backwards. Uh, but the idea being, don't set yourself a destination. Because if you don't reach that destination, now what? We've failed in that mindset, right? But instead, if we know we got time to go and come back, it kind of can set ourselves up for more success or a, more of a morale boost, right? Versus a stressor, okay? Um, as far as uh, tension in the leash, okay, which is when the dog pulls ahead or is pulling to the side, that can build up stress, okay? So our goal is to limit that tension when it comes to walking with them. Um, practicing, of course, and then understanding that it takes a lot of patience, right? Puppies in general take a lot of patience. Dogs in general take a lot of patience. Um, and we understand that. So as long as we know that going in, it doesn't get fixed overnight. There's not one piece of equipment we can put on them and have it, you know, be all perfect afterwards, right? But understand that patience and consistency over time, we can feel more and more comfortable about it, right? Um, like I mentioned earlier about my dog, when we first started taking classes, it was months and months afterwards that I really felt like, oh wow, we are actually making some progress, you know? So it takes some time, but understanding that I think is really important too, okay? All right, so some expectations to help us out as far as from our dog's perspective, okay? Dogs are not soldiers, they're not robots, they're not accessories, you know, they're living beings with feelings and with uh, mental capacity, right? To think and interact and interpret their environment, right? They're getting so much sensory input, right? More than we could ever understand, you know? Smelling is one thing, but just hearing and, and tasting, right? If you ever watch your dog <laughs> on a walk, or I'll give you my perspective, she's touching things with her tongue often, right? We don't do that. Maybe we do, but we don't. <laughs> but they do it and they're gathering all this information, right? So we don't want, we don't want to prevent them from interacting with their environment. Because again, what is the purpose of this walk? Enrichment, right? Not just exercise. Though exercise will be achieved 
your goal is a tired dog, you can still get it the same way through an enrichment-based walk, okay? Some dogs, if you've ever ran with a dog, they often keep pace a lot better when we run. You know, has anyone ever recognized that? But when we walk, they're like, why are you going so slow, right? They have double the legs that we do. Their gait is just as long as us, if not longer, plus all that sensory input, right? So I like to compare us walking for a dog to be crawling. Compare those paces together. Uh, so think about it from their perspective, right? If you felt like you were crawling and you just want to interact with the environment, it can be frustrating too for them. That's why that leash tension starts to appear and they start to pull towards that stuff they want to interact with. But I encourage you throughout this presentation and throughout your walks to let them interact with stuff. And we'll go more in depth with that in a second. But again, if our expectations are enrichment, then it makes sense to let them smell this thing or walk in the puddle or, or smell that mailbox, whatever it may be, prevented or, or I guess meaning it's not a dangerous situation. As long as there's no danger involved or no trespassing or whatever, uh, let them interact with their environment. Okay, and we'll go deep into that. And, and that kind of branches off of what life rewards are. Has anyone ever heard that term, life rewards? So when we reward dogs, usually it's treats or something they can eat, right? But letting your dog wade in a, in a pond or a stream or smell a mailbox or smell a flower bush, that's a life reward. You know, it's not necessarily something they're consuming, but it is something that they're getting a lot out of ver uh, through smelling, tasting, manipulating, even digging is a life reward. You know, it's things that they like to do that we can encourage them to do on our walks. Again, I think that's gonna be very beneficial for you guys and your dogs to give them that space to do those activities, okay? And those, those are gonna be the things we'll kind of look for as we're going through. So getting into gear, all right? Some gear that you're gonna see listed on this slide is very, it's either promoted through mainstream outlets, it's sold at pet stores, right? They utilize it as quick fixes, okay? But I wanna be super clear that though some of, these, some of this gear you're gonna see may produce a quick result, but the methods that it's using to get there and also the potential of unwanted behavior issues that can happen down the line, it, it's not worth it, right? So some of the gear we know this, a slip lead, this is just a simple slip lead right here. Um, it's not necessarily gonna cause a lot of pain, but is not conducive for what we're accomplishing with a leash walk, right? Slip leads are great for short distance transfers at the shelter. Uh, we use these all the time because it's easy on and off, right? The last thing you want when you're walking your dog is <laughs> for it to come off easy, right? Choke chains are similar to that, except for they're made of metal and they, use, they constrict their windpipe. Um, retractable leashes, these are, other, these are very common, but it's not common to hear the adverse effects of a retractable leash. Same with a flexi leash. If you are walking your dog with a retractable leash and it's unlocked, right, so they can go and come as they please, there's no point in that time that they're not pulling against tension and I'll rephrase it, they're always pulling against tension if they're on a retractable leash and it's unlocked. Dogs have an opposition reflex, which is when they feel tension, they pull against it. And if we are letting our dog go out on a retractable leash, they're get actually getting reinforced, they're getting rewarded because they can interact with their thing, whatever it may be, by pulling on that leash, pulling on that tension. Right? So that can lead to more pulling down the line if you ever go to a regular leash or just forever with the retractable. Right? Also, I don't have any images on here, but retractable leashes can cause major injuries to you. Right? Uh, if you have a dog or small one that wraps around your leg and pulls, it's like a candle cutter. You know? I mean, it can really do some damage and burn and sever fingers. And I saved you the drama of pictures, but if you feel brave, look it up because it is pretty dramatic. Um, prong collars are big ones too. Um, prong collars, I mean, everyone understands the concept of these metal prongs sticking in their neck, right? Some dogs, or some people will justify it if their dog has thick fur, but in reality, what it's doing is it's causing pain and discomfort to our dog when they pull, right? 
What this can lead to besides trachea issues is reactivity to other people or dogs. Hello. Sorry. You're welcome, boys. Uh, so if we think about what it's doing, okay, let's say our dog is the most friendly dog in the world, loves to interact with people, other animals, all that. They just love life, okay? We put a, a prong collar on them, all right? And their favorite person walks up and they want to go see them and they're moving towards them and they're feeling this prong, this pain sensation, okay, they can start to associate the sight of that person or people in general with this feeling, okay, which can lead to leash reactivity, aggression, uh, just reactivity in general, right, because of that association that's happening, you know, and then if that gear, if that piece of equipment doesn't work, now what are you going to do, right, because what you're also doing is damaging the trust with your dog by causing this pain. Right? And again, we don't want to ever put them in a situation where our trust is in jeopardy uh, or that we're causing them pain, right? especially when it's not necessary. Um, the other piece of equipment on here is the e-collar, the shock collar. Again, the way that we would hope that our dogs would take this information that we're giving them, right? If our dog barks at a person, we press the button or something. I honestly don't know how they use that equipment because I've never used it, but the concepts don't make sense, right? Because in reality, if we can reinforce a behavior that we like and that they like, like walking near us, we can reinforce them for that. Chances are the dogs will, would rather do this, okay? So in a, in a sense, they're learning to do this on their own and that's where we want to get to. But the concept of, it, of positive punishment, which is adding something to decrease the likelihood of a behavior is really not on our radar at all. So. Uh, be mindful again that these type, this gear can cause more issues than what we would have wanted to solve originally, right? All we wanted to do was fix leash pulling. Now we have a dog that barks and is aggressive to any person or, or animal that comes near it, right? So again, weigh the pros and cons of that gear if that's something you're thinking about or please reach out to us because um, we love to switch people from that type of uh, techniques to others. And that's what I'm going to show you in this next slide. Uh, well, we'll talk about off-leash at the very end. So helpful gear. Uh, treat pouches and treats are gear. They're tools that we utilize, right? And I'm gonna send you this um, the PowerPoint and everything so you guys um, will all have it afterwards too with the video. But the idea being treat pouches and treats, okay, are just as valuable as leashes and collars and harnesses, okay? We use those to reinforce behaviors that we like versus behaviors we don't like, which we're not gonna correct them. We're just gonna try to redirect them to something else. So for leash walking specifically, we tend to tell people to use high value treats. Chicken, cheese, turkey dogs, string cheese, peanut butter. All this stuff is very high value because what you're dealing with when you walk your dog is infinite distractions, infinite stimulation, right? Um, and if we can utilize something our dog likes a whole lot in those distracting environments, we can increase our success rate, right? We can increase our ability to get their focus because that's what we utilize treats for on a walk, to get their focus and to reinforce good behaviors that we want them to keep doing, right? Um, harnesses are great too. Um, that picture that's up there and this harness that's up on this table, you can look at afterwards. Um, it has a clip on the front and the back, right? So what this does is it gives us an option to either clip on the front of their harness or the back, right, or both at the same time. Uh, we all use this for our dogs, and I know y'all have a couple too. It comes with this leash that has two clips on it, which is a genius invention, and I wish I could have thought of that. But the idea being you have two points of contact on your dog versus just one, right? One, if it's on the back of the dog, and they pull and we hold, what it can do is lift them up, right? Now, from the other dog or person's perspective, they're like, that dog looks like a Clydesdale right now, right? So it can send mixed signals. So two points of contact helps redirect them to you, so then you can get their focus, okay? And that harness too, you can kind of see on the, end, on the back right there, it has a little slip, okay? And you'll see it over here close up at the end. It has a slip to prevent dogs from backing out of it. Now some can, right? Small ones like Sophie can, right? So we have to be really careful with that. But 
that slip is, is better than a, just a traditional harness because it removes this gap that sometimes is created when they back up and they slip their head right through, right? So security is really important with the gear that we use, but again, it's not invasive. It's not causing any pain, no stress on the neck, um, very comfortable, and we all walk our dogs with this. Again, you don't have to clip it to the front. You could just clip it to the back, um, and it would just be like a normal harness. But safety and security is very important too when it comes to walking. It also, again, helps with redirecting them to us so then we can get their focus and then proceed. Um, a couple other things that will help a martingale collar. This is a martingale collar. It's just a flat nylon collar, but it has the slip function, right? So it does tighten around the neck, but it tightens to a point. It doesn't infinitely tighten like a slip lead or a choke chain would. Um, so for some dogs who are either sensitive about having things over their head or over around their body, that may be perfectly fine. Um, I, don't, I don't, wouldn't encourage that too much for a long distance walk, uh, or at least with a long leash, but it is, it is a piece of equipment that we stand by because it's not invasive and doesn't cause pain. Though it does secure, so that way it doesn't slide off of their head. Uh, but I would stick towards more the harness, but we definitely have people utilize these and, and it helps them too. Um, a head halter is a simple, it kind of looks like a collar, but it just goes around their snout, right? And what that does is it gives you control of their head. For major leash pullers or for giant dogs with smaller humans, uh, this is a way that they can walk their dog without causing pain. But what it does do is when they pull, it funnels all that right into the front of their face to where they'll kind of stand next to you to release that tension that's on the leash. Again, we're kind of getting into discomfort, right? But there is a difference between discomfort and, and pain, right? Uh, but again, if you ask me, I'll always funnel you to the harness first, and then if there's issues down the line, then we can kind of find a piece of gear that works better, okay? Um, the leashes that you use are really important too. Six, 10 foot leashes are pretty standard, uh, but uh, for long walks, right, or for hikes or for more space, uh, you can use a long line, right? You'd be very surprised that when a dog walks on a long line, how close they do stick to you, right? Uh, but environments, environments and the way you walk and, and all that should determine which gear is best suited for you guys, right? So some of the um, benefits of it, we can reinforce good behaviors, not invasive. We can give them freedom to smell. The last one, they're always connected to you, right? Again, we're not advocating for off-leash uh, walks at all. Uh, the leash, though, once we get into some of these techniques, are strictly for safety, okay? We're not using the leash to maneuver the dog, strictly for safety, okay? All right, some pre-walk tips. This is a map of right out here. Um, know your dog. Know what your dog likes. Know what sets your dog off. Know um, your dog's distraction level, right? Th knowing this beforehand is going to set us up for success, okay? Every dog is different, uh, but knowing how we can set them up for as much success as possible is gonna be in your best interest, okay? And knowing your environment is the same way. Know that at uh, three o'clock on a Saturday, this place is flooded. So if your dog doesn't do well with the sight of other dogs or is reactive, it may not be in your best interest at that time, you know, to go out for a walk. Again, we want to know as much as we can before we go walking so that way we can be confident saying, all right, we're gonna accomplish something today, right? Departure cues are really important for your dog's arousal level. If you are at your house, and a lot of us do this, I do this, we ask them, do you wanna go for a walk? And they're like, yes. They're like, I've been waiting for you to ask me that, right? Um, that's one sign, right? Another one is simply just putting on shoes, grabbing the leash, grabbing the harness, all these things are just reaffirming to our dog that we're about to go outside right so by the time you get to the front door and your dog's on a leash they're probably jumping super excited can't wait to get out the door and then what happens when you open the door like a rocket right so something that can help you out with that is what I like to call decompression zones or just a small decompression uh, time with them give them a moment to bring their arousal level down or do some focus exercises with them to help them bring their arousal level down right because if we do all those things, 
by the time we get out the door, now we're just going, right? And we're not being systematic. We're not being um, as mindful to set us up for success, right? So recognizing that, recognizing those things that we do, it's not saying don't do them, but it's just recognizing them. So that way we know, all right, our dog is at a 10 right now. Let's wait till they get at least to something manageable, and then we can go out the door, right? Because what this is also doing for our dog, if they're jumping so excited and we open the door, which is where they want it to go, right? They start to learn, all right, this is what I do because it leads me out the door, right? But we can do other things. We can ask them to sit. We can get their focus. Uh, we can just let them breathe for a second and then go, right? Because then ultimately they will learn as long as we're consistent, calmness leads us to the outside versus over arousal or overstimulation, you know? Uh, but you can start to recognize those things. When you go and grab your shoes, watch what your dog does. Because mine, I know, she always knows when I'm getting my shoes, something's about to happen. So she could be dead asleep, hear me rustling around, see me get, putting my shoes on, and now she's right up next to me saying, what's about to happen, right? So recognizing that's really important. And also trigger stacking. Um, that term is basically recognizing that one small event happens that causes a little bit of stress. And another small event happens, causes a little bit of stress too. And then more and more events start happening, no matter how small, they all start to compound on themselves, right? So then by the fourth or fifth thing that happens, whether it's small or not, it may seem more so. You know, it could be if your dog doesn't like riding in a car and you drive them to a place, and they see another dog through the car window and they're barking at them. And then you finally get to the place and then they see a squirrel and they're just completely overwhelmed, right? All these small things happen that lead them to a point of, it's not to say it's not successful, but it's gonna be challenging because their focus is elsewhere, right? And they're distracted and they're stimulated and potentially stressed too. So knowing this information beforehand can help us set ourselves up for success. I'm gonna keep harping back to that, okay? So here's some exercises that we're going to cover. Uh, this is not necessarily specific to leash walking, but it helps with leash walking. Okay, and I'll explain. One, this is simply a, a technique of how to hold the leash. We'll go with this simply. So this is called the leash lock. And I'll have to fix that. Let's see. Okay. So what you're gonna see here is a technique of how to shorten the leash without wrapping your hands, okay? It's very common for us to wrap our hands with the leash, and if we have a giant dog and they pull while we've wrapped our hands, we could cause ourselves some pain and discomfort, right? So what you're gonna see is you, me put my hand through the leash, okay? Then you take your hand like a high five, bend your pointer finger, and you're simply just gonna wrap your pointer finger only, okay? What this does is it puts tension just on that finger versus your whole hand, okay? So it's just a short little clip right here. So the end of that video right there where I dropped my finger, right? The reason I did that is so that way you can see what happens even if we lose that grip? We still have something, right? So when it comes to putting leashes on, uh, it's very important that we at first put our hand through the loop, okay? And then we do something with our hand. So even if we lose this, we still have something, right, to maintain control and security so that way our dog's not running around, right? So that's the leash lock. Next is gonna be some eye contact games you can play with your dog, right? If we learn to utilize these eye contact games with our dog, our dog will learn that eye contact makes magic happen, okay? And you can do this in a lot of different ways. This is just a few exercises you're gonna see, but if our dogs understand that eye contact leads to desirable results in one context and another and another, it can translate to leash walking, all right? I don't expect our dog to be staring at us for the walk, right? I don't want that, but we can teach them that eye contact makes things happen. So if they learn to offer eye contact, it makes our job easier to either get their focus in a distracting environment or ask them to do something, okay? So you're gonna see lots of eyes right here, okay? <laughs> now, 
Eye contact is magic, okay? So these are the games we're gonna go over. We're gonna go over offered eye contact, simply waiting for our dog to look at us, and when they do, we can reward them. The name game, it's very simple. You say your dog's name, when they look at you, reward them, right? But try not to repeat. That's something that we kind of teach in our beginner class, that repeating their name can really dampen the value of what their name actually means, right? Watching is very simple. You show your dog a treat and bring it up to your eyes. When they follow the treat, treat them. When they look at us, treat them, okay? Toy tossing. You're gonna toss a toy out in front. Just wait, all right? Your dog may try to go get it. When your dog looks back to you, you then let them go get the toy. Eye contact gives them access to the toy. You can use that in the same example of your dog smelling a mailbox. We want them to smell a mailbox and it's okay. Don't let them pull you to it, but wait. If they look back at you, then you can say, yes, go smell the mailbox, right? Eye contact makes things happen. Treat tossing is very similar, except for you let them go get the food. Um, eye contact feeding is a great exercise I love to teach people because uh, what it does is something you can do with them every day, all right? So if you have a bowl of food right here and you're about to put it on the ground, watch where your dog's eyes are. Chances are they're laser locked on the bowl, right? <laughs> See what they start to do. They'll start to make choices with their eyes. They'll look at the bowl, look at you, bowl, you, bowl. When they look at you, start to lower the bowl slowly, okay? If they look at the bowl, freeze, right? So the, looking at the bowl doesn't make it happen. Doesn't make the result happen. It could make the opposite happen. It could go higher. But if they make eye contact with us, we can start lowering it. Boom, all the way to the ground. So it's something that they learn very quickly. <laughs> Eye contact makes these desirable results happen. And I try to teach people these, these games outside of leash walking so that way it can start to trickle into leash walking, right? Eye contact makes good things happen, that's totally true. So you're gonna see a video right here. I'll just let it run, but all it is gonna be showing you are those exercises we just talked about, okay? Again, you'll, um, you'll get this in an um, email as well. Yes. Yes. Watch. Good. Eric, watch. Yes. Say hello. So you see a lot of different ways that eye contact can be utilized, right? And the one I didn't mention that you saw in the video was greeting new people, right? That's a big one. Uh, but we have to be mindful of the context, right? Is this the first time they've met this person? What's their environment like? What has led up to that greeting, you know? But practice outside of that environment really sets you up for success, right? So eye contact, all she did was lure it. And then once she had her dogs focused, then she cued the greeting. Right? And that can be huge. If our dogs learn that eye contact leads to interacting with new people, right, that's usually like the top shelf stimulating thing is new people or new animals. Uh, but it's ways to work towards, right? Things you can get to. All right, so this last exercise uh, before we get to leash walking is another one of my favorites. It's called the tension recall. So inevitably, our dogs are gonna pull at some point and create tension. What this exercise does is it gives them the opportunity to create slack in the leash on their own. Okay, so we're not going to be pulling them back. I want you to watch this. Um, the idea is your dog gets to the end of the leash and we simply wait. Okay, it takes patience. And all you're doing is just bracing the leash. You're not pulling again, you're just holding. Okay, what your dog's going to do is be at the end of the leash and eventually look back at you. When they look back at you, you're gonna mark it, you say yes, good job, and then offer them food at your hip. Okay, what that's gonna do, your dog's gonna come all the way back to you and get the food, okay? They may go back out to the end of the leash, but 
the exercise just continues. We're waiting for them to check back in. When they check back in, reward them, right? You'll start to see this rubber band effect. In fact, where they go to the end of the leash and as soon as it gets tight, they turn around and start coming back on their own. That's what we want. So what we want to do is, this, is establish a new reflex for our dog, which isn't the opposition reflex pulling against the leash, but in fact, it's the opposite of the opposition reflex, right? I never said that out loud, but it makes sense. The idea is they feel tension and check back in. That's what we want them to start learning because if they get stimulated or pull at the end of the leash, our next step as handlers is gonna to be to get their focus somehow, right? Um, and them already starting to come back to us and look at us makes that step a lot easier. Do you mark that when they do that? Like when they come back, do you say like kill or? So not necessarily. I would just mark the fact that they are coming back okay. versus just trying to cue them in a spot, okay. you know? Um, but yeah, that's a great question. And it does help with tangle dogs too. You know, I've experimented with my dog out here with the many light poles that are around. When they feel that tension, they'll start to backtrack and then clear themselves. So it's interesting to kind of watch that come into play. But so here's a little video with Echo. There you go. Yeah, yeah it's that good. That wasn't a lot of tension. But just a <gasps> <Bye. laughs> Echo. Yeah. Yes, good. One more. Yeah. Yes, beautiful. <gasps> good. Echo. <gasps> yeah. Yes, good. A little bit more slack. Good. So Echo. that last one, right? She didn't even get to the end of the leash before she was already looking back, right? Um, there was two clips within that video right there. One was with a short leash, and then the second one was with a longer leash. Uh, what that does is it helps the dog learn, even if they're further from the human resource, whatever it is, um, they can still come all the way back, right? But it is very important with this that you reward at your side versus going to them to treat them, right? Because the idea is we want them to come all the way back, uh, but we have to give them time to do that, you know? Uh, but I love that exercise and it's easier with two people. So you can see I was kind of luring ahead. It's easier with two people, but if it's just you, you can go somewhere and sit and let the dog just explore. And then when they check in, yes, make a big deal about how good it is that they're doing that. Okay. So the other person was out in front luring the dog away. Yes, just very slightly. So I, I, that's me. I do that uh, because there's a, there's a, line that we don't want to cross right we don't want to you know intensively pull the dog at the end of the leash we just want to we just want the dog to feel the tension so what i like to do is just show them a piece of food once they get fairly close i'll remove the food and i'll back away so i'm creating distance because i don't want to, the dog to keep pulling against the tension i just want it to feel the tension and then once they're at that point they're usually still looking at me waiting like this and then i have the handler just hang out back now, if it's taking a long, long time, or there's distractions, the handler can always vocalize, make a little sound, those kissy sounds, those any sounds to kind of encourage the dog to, oh, there you are, kind of remind them. I also tell them first before they make sounds, I have them slide into the dog's peripherals. Uh, so in a sense, if the dog's pulling ahead and the human's directly behind the dog, just slide to the left or right so it just kind of graces their peripherals and then they'll look and then we can continue and sometimes just one or two of those reminders really helps them to okay i'm checking back in with you this is what we do right great question great question again we're not pulling them that's super important too you can also do this exercise with a long line uh attached to something else like a fence and then you can stand without the leash in your hand and let them keep seeking you out uh, that's like the progression of this exercise. It's short leash, longer leash, tether, like long line in your hand, and then a tether offline where you're not even attached at all and your dog's seeking you out, right? Not just following the leash back. So we can always proof it to the next level. All right, so now we're going to get into, sorry about that, to the walking, okay? Now the way we have this broken down is, I don't know why that looks so funky. There we go. Um, we have it broken down as far as the setup goes, 
how to reset your dog without pulling, and then the actual walking part, okay? How to reinforce them for walking. So this is what we're gonna break down, but this is the goal. This is Garth, he's gonna show you what, what we're looking for. And that's Good his job. sister up front. Good job, buddy. <laughs> all right, so the setup first. Do you worry about over training them, or not at all? Well, so we'll kind of get into that as far as we're gonna be reinforcing a lot early, and then we can ease off on it, you know? Uh, but over treating is, is different than treating with higher value stuff, right? So we can kind of balance out the amount that we give them by what we use and how we deliver it. Because okay. sometimes if they just lick a, a, a stick of string cheese, it's just as good or, or tiny little pieces, you know? But we do say pea-sized treats if you can, small ones. But um, I don't typically, not typically worry about overfeeding them in the sense of just walking, you but know? You always well, so we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Okay, that's okay. Uh, but so as far as the setup goes, how it starts, right? Uh, I do have the treats on the side of the dog. So this may be counterintuitive to what we normally think, because the leash is in the opposite hand. Okay, I'll remind y'all the leash isn't utilized for movement. We're not using the leash to move the dog, but in fact, we're using the treats and the reinforcement to relocate the dog, which we'll do in the next slides. Uh, but we want the treats on the side of the dog, so that way the treating is most efficient, okay? It's most efficient to treat right next to you than it is to treat across your body, right? Um, it won't take long for you to treat them like this, try to treat them next to you and say, this doesn't feel good for me, right? We want it to be as relaxed as possible. So the leash goes across your body. As far as where the dog should be or where to treat them, my idea is I like to say that Keeping the dog within nose reach is most beneficial for you because if they're within nose reach, you can reinforce them, you can treat them, you can get their focus on you, or you can redirect them by luring them with the food, all right? Um, now, I will mention this about the treats since you brought that up too. Um, treats could also be used for other reasons, right? So let's say if an off-leash dog is to approach you, right, you can utilize that, those treats and toss them hopefully towards the dog or away, and that dog can go that way, you know? Um, but earlier when we were talking about tools and all, I should have mentioned that about the treats, but they can be very useful in other ways too. Um, our goal, as far as this setup goes, is to have slack in the leash. Some people will call it a valley or an arc in the leash, uh, but that's what we're looking for is slack. Because remember, tension can increase stress in our dogs, right? <coughs> Okay, so the first step as far as resetting goes, let me see if this video will cooperate. So the first, set in re or the first step in resetting is a straight lure, okay? So we're at the point, before we get to walking, practicing what to do in the event our dog pulls ahead, okay? Because that is inevitable. Right, our dog's gonna pull at some point, it's how do we bring them back without forcing them back, okay? So this is one method and there's three or four that I'm gonna show you. This one is just a lure, okay? So if your dog pulls ahead, the first thing you need to do is stop walking, right? Sounds simple, but we've all been on skates before, some real skates, some imaginary skates, but if our dog pulls and we follow behind them, that's reinforcing their pull, right? In other words, they learn, I just gotta pull hard enough, I'll go smell that tree over there, okay? So think about how to relocate your dog without pulling, that's the goal. Um, and like I said, there's more, multiple methods and it doesn't matter which one works for you because it may not be the same one that works for me. Everyone's different, you know, so you have some options. So I'll show you the video, but I'll explain it first. Sterling's going to be ahead of her, okay? She's going to bring a treat to his nose and simply swing him around to her side and then treat him. Then he's going to pop around and do it again. Uh, but the idea is when you're luring, you have to keep the treat close to the dog's nose so they stay interested in it versus going too high or too far and they're like, well, what's that over there? All right, so keeping that reinforcement close to their nose is gonna be very important uh, for them to focus and stay interested in it, okay? Once they get next to you, you can mark that and treat them, right? So we're marking them being next to us because this is where the reinforcement happens, not out there, okay, right here. All right, so here's a little video of Sterling. 
Yes. Close. So go ahead and reset again. Yes. Good. Beautiful. Good job. Same thing. Yes. Good. That's good. Yes. Good job. Yes. Good. Good job. Good. So, Sterling, this dog right here, this pointer, he was so used to getting treats in front of the owner, he was like, this is where I get treats from. He's never even gotten treats from this angle, right? So this practicing this is huge for him to realize, oh, I can get treats by sitting and looking at you in this direction, you know? For some dogs, it may just be, be beneficial to just stand next to them and treat them consistently so they can recognize that, oh, this is where stuff happens too, right? Uh, and when you step back, it is important that you step and open yourself up so that way for a bigger dog like him, you can swing him around because we can only reach so far, you know. Uh, but again, this is just one method. So this next one, whoopsie, is what I use for big dogs, okay. It's similar to that luring, but it also requires us to move a little bit. So I call it just the lure plus movement or momentum, okay. Everything is very similar. You're going to stop bring the dog a treat right to its nose, then you're simply gonna walk backwards and then walk forwards, keeping that treat low by their nose. The difference in this and the other one is that the dog is doing the resetting, not us doing the lure. Okay, so we're simply gonna move backwards and forwards and watch, this is Tito, he's a big Dane, he's gonna do the spinning, okay? All right, but yeah. Good, good. So use that, whoop, that's okay. So show him the treat and then backpedal. Take some steps back. Good, now step up. Good, there you go, good. That movement backwards and then movement forwards gives the dog space to do the resetting. I love that, that's what I prefer to do with my dog because it keeps us both engaged. We're moving back and forth, we're kind of dancing together, right? But the idea is that we're still not pulling him, right? When he got to the end, she stopped. She showed him the tree. She didn't bring it all the way to his nose, but we were in their backyard, so it wasn't too distracting. Uh, but movement backwards and forwards helped him do the whole reset, right? Okay, so the next option is gonna be using a touch. So touch is simply a nose target to our fingers. Um, I don't have enough time to explain the whole concept of touch, but I want you to watch this video and recognize that her dog is simply going where she puts her fingers. Okay, so it's very similar. Dog pulls ahead, she stops. She shows her dog a target, a nose target, and then she flips it and does it one more time. Okay, it's again, another option uh, to relocate them without pulling. And then once she gets next to her, uh, she's gonna treat her. This is Priya. Yeah. Good, yeah. all right, so bring her back. Good. But I'll kind of demo for you. So the dog was ahead, she stopped, she presented her hand to her side for a touch target, and then she did it once more parallel to herself, right? So her dog in fact did two touches to get back to her side, and then she treated her right there, okay? Notice in the last two videos where we were practicing, right? In their backyards, comfortable places, right? We'll go into how to, more steps to succeed in a little bit. Uh, but it's most conducive to practice these exercises in environments your dog is already comfortable in. Because it's not only the dog who's learning these exercises, but it's us, right? So we want to be comfortable doing it before we get out here and it's like, what goes where? And there's a dog over there, but I got to go this way. You know, there's a lot of factors. So try to set yourself up for success as far as practice goes in environments that are most familiar. Going right into this, right? The actual walking knowing that we're more likely to succeed when there's limited distractions and then we can progress not to say don't do your normal walks but be reasonable as far as success goes understand that if our dog is totally stimulated 
and we go to a new environment and practice this, the success rate goes down, right? But if we're comfortable and confident, because we've practiced at home in the driveway from our mailbox to another mailbox, we can feel more confident knowing, all right, we can at least recognize small wins, okay? So as far as walking goes, right? So we've learned how to reset them. Now, as far as walking, what to do? It's very important that we're consistent or whoever walks our dog is very consistent with what we do, you know? Because in, again, inevitably they're gonna pull ahead. It's how to bring them back if they do pull ahead, okay? So consistency, reinforcement schedule. So this is harping on the treats right here, okay? We like to treat them a lot and often early. Okay, especially if they've never gotten treats this way or even never gotten treats on walk. The idea is if they're next to us, we're treating them, okay? Now, what a reinforcement schedule is, is let's say we treated, I don't know, every 10 feet, okay? Then we start holding out on the treats and then we treat every 30 feet, okay? The schedule changes, right? She's like, all right, you're not treating as often as you were, but you're still treating, okay? Then we can randomize it. Okay, the power of randomizing a treat schedule is just as powerful as treating every time, okay? Because the thought is there, right? So this can help with, if overfeeding is a, a thought we're having, is I can treat you every other time, or I can treat you randomly, but the thought is if you're gonna treat me, I'm still hanging in there with you, okay? Right? Now where you have the treats is very important too, because we've all had the dog that bunny hops with us, right? Trying to get those treats out of our hands. Um, so be mindful of where you have the treat, either at the dog's nose or up at your nose or your shoulder or up here. Okay, because what that does, that movement of the treat up is similar to one of those eye contact exercise games we did. It's a way to encourage them to check in with us while we're walking. Emphasis on check in, not stare at us, because then they're gonna run into things, right? <laughs> I don't want them to run into things. We want them to experience their world. But Luring eye contact while you're walking is very important. Um, also engaging with them, talking with them, praising them, letting them know how good they're doing because what that does is it makes us more interesting in a very interesting world, right? It doesn't matter what we say. I call them sweet nothings, right? Good job, you're doing so good. How's your day? It doesn't matter, right? But we're talking to them, right? We're engaging them. We're becoming more interesting. Um, next, kind of going on those life rewards. Letting them sniff things, right? I think it's very important to let them do that. Uh, earlier when we talked about giving ourselves a time limit versus a distance goal, I think that's super important because if we imagine what it's like to be a dog and to be pulled past all these smelly things, remember earlier those three dogs that were outside and they were kind of wanting to smell that light pole right there and he was like, let's keep going, right? Think of how frustrating that is, right? Take your time. We don't have goals of, of going anywhere. Uh, but let them smell those things, you know. We all have places to be, so that is a factor, right? I, I try to walk my dog when I don't have to be somewhere or if I know I have plenty of time to take our time. Um, but if you find yourself in a situation and your dog's smelling something and you're like, ah, oh, smelling another tree, smelling another mailbox, think about it differently. Think about all the information they're getting, all the enrichment they're getting, all the just stimulation they're getting from letting them do that certain thing, okay? They're in our houses probably 70% of the time, if not more, right? Let them experience this novelty, right? But be mindful that novelty is a factor when it comes to their overstimulation, you know? But um, given they're not standing there for 30 minutes smelling a light pole, I think it's very beneficial to let them interact with their environment. Um, so that's a common question people have is, can my dog smell things? Should I let them smell things? Absolutely. Let them smell on things, let them pee on things, let them interact with their environment given safety, right? Um, taking breaks is the last part of this. Uh, if you find that you're walking your dog and you're getting frustrated, stop and take a break. Doesn't have to be long, but just stop, pet on your dog, take a deep breath, right? That break just breaks the pattern of either stressing on pulling them or trying to reset them or trying to prevent them from interacting with something. Breaks are super healthy. Just know that you should do that. Uh, and that way, we can also just, see, just be with our dog, bond with them. Remember why you got them and pet them and love on them. Because if we're stressed, chances are they're stressed too, right? It trickles down just as much as it trickles up, right? So this is Athena, quick little clip of her walking.
And just watch how she's checking in. He's going down to treat her. She's looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up, right? Uh, and you don't always have to treat, you know? Engaging verbally is just as powerful, right? But letting them know how good they're doing, um, it does boost their confidence. And it boosts your confidence, right? Remember celebrating those small wins, looking at things a little bit differently to where we can recognize small things that they're doing that's most beneficial. So some steps to success, we've kind of harped on it. Familiar environments, so that way we can learn the techniques, right? High value reinforcers. Cheese, string cheese is a big piece that we can utilize for focus, but also give them tiny pieces. Um, for small dogs, and I'll talk about it in a second, you could put peanut butter on the end of a ladle to treat them down there, right? So you don't have to be all the way down there. Reinforce them early and often, right? Treat them early, so that way we can tamper off, right? But we really wanna overwhelm their sense of like, man, this is just the place to be, right? Over here, again, we're not forcing them. We want them to willingly hang out over here, okay? Deep breaths, celebrate the small wins. Again, that's gonna boost our confidence going forward. Uh, and giving yourself and your dogs breaks. I think that's huge, especially for bonding. So here's Sterling again. Good. Resetting as she's walking. Yes, I give up. Good. So in that, at the very end of that clip, she kind of held the treat up as she was walking. Right? It doesn't always have to be down there, but holding it up encourages that prolonged check-in as we're moving. Again. Not ideal for him to do that for 30 yards, but for five feet, it helps because the eye contact is rewarding for him, okay? And then she also reset it when he walked ahead. So real quickly, we're right at three, so I'm gonna kinda, I'm gonna go into this as much as I can, but also be mindful of y'all's time. Some common things that happen, dogs get overstimulated, right? They get distracted, they get aroused, and some are reactive. Earlier we talked about those using those decompression times to kind of ease them down before you walk out the door, that's really important, right? That can really be helpful. Um, during the walk, seeing something that's either novel, smelling something that's novel, or something that's reactive. A couple of tips you can do and without going too much into reactivity because that's a whole another presentation, um, rewarding them for observing something calmly, okay? That is the nutshell of reactivity. That's what we want to accomplish. Now, how we accomplish it is a whole list of things, uh, but one option is just, if you recognize it, reinforce it. That's what you're gonna see in this video right here. So this is my sister's dog, Benji, looking at this giant spider in somebody's yard on Halloween, right? And it's gonna start moving in a second. So <laughs> recognizing that, something that may be scary, observing it and being treated for it is huge, okay? Another option is a treat scatter. So simply taking multiple pieces of food, tossing them on the ground, letting them forage. Uh, if our dogs get over aroused by the sight of other people or dogs, this is a tactic to give them something to do that they like, that's decompressing for them. Also, it does buy some time, especially in grass. So if you have treats, toss them in grass, let them kind of forage and pick. Hopefully while that thing's passing, you know, given they can't observe calmly. Uh, reactivity is a whole nother, like I said, a whole nother level of things, but our goal is calm observation. If they can't observe calmly, we try to give them something else to do, right? Uh, biting at the leash is a common one. Um, most rescue dogs, or a lot of rescue dogs, they're not used to walking on a leash. A chain leash is an option, because it's not as, they don't want to bite it. Um, also having something they can put in their mouth, a chew toy or a ball or a tug or something with you. So when they get overstimulated, instead of biting at the leash or at your arm, you can give them something to do. Easier said than done, I totally get it. But if they are going to be biting at something, we'd rather give them something to bite versus us. A lot of it has to do with overstimulation and arousal levels, okay? Uh, puppies who like to zigzag, right? Novel stimulus is everywhere. So what we can think about again is reinforcing them a lot next to us, okay? One trainer that uh, we all follow, her name is Hannah Brannigan, talks about um, a treat window. Okay, where you deliver the treats. Know that it's a drive-through window that the dog needs to come to, not a delivery, not treating out in front, right? It's a cool, it's a cool uh, comparison right there, but it makes sense, okay? Know that the treats are all right here versus reaching out and delivering out in front, okay? Dogs freeze on a walk. Um, you could do the gingerbread trail, right, of treats. 
you can use touch, that video we saw, or this two-step and treat method. I'm gonna show you this video of real quick. This is again, Benji. We're walking over this bridge right here. So I'm just gonna place treats on the ground. And then once he eats them, then I'm gonna walk ahead and then place another. So he's always getting treats either next to me or behind me. This is a great way to teach them. This is where treats happen too. Also how to lure them if they freeze, okay? Because we don't want to pull them. Oftentimes the puppies, when they freeze and we tug on the leash, then they really freeze, right? That tension, again, we want to prevent tension. Uh, for small dogs, peanut butter ladle. So that way we can reach it down without going all the way down or we could lure them completely. Uh, or the string cheese is again, a great, great option. Okay. All right, off-leash stuff. I put this at the end because I could talk forever, so we'll just be brief. This is a in Pelham, off-leash dogs. Everyone understands how dangerous this can be, all right? You got three dogs in this video right here, and how many humans do you see? There isn't any, right? Except for the one filming, <laughs> which is Meredith. Uh, but the idea being, this is such a sketchy situation for all parties involved that we do not want to be involved in this, okay? Um, so I don't think anyone here, if you're here, you're not probably taking your dog off leash, but understand uh, the severity of the issue. Only knew, you know your dog, the other people don't know your dog, and we don't know the other people. That's a, that's a thought that we often forget about too, is that a friend of ours could have been attacked by a dog as a young kid, but then see a small, friendly off-leash dog running up to her and panic attack, you know? It can happen to all of us, it can happen to the dogs. Um, so there's infinite variables about this. I don't need to harp on it too much, but please don't put your dogs, let your dogs off leash, especially in a public environment, especially when there's a dog park right there, you know? So um, there's a lot of issues with that. If you have questions, please email me. If you live in a place that has off leash dogs, email me and I'll by all means contact who I can uh, because uh, it puts you at jeopardy and puts your dog at jeopardy, puts the other dog at jeopardy. Uh, when in fact we could just be responsible and manage the situation completely. Uh, it's no more impressive and the opposite if you walk with your dog off leash versus on leash. You know, it's just a, it's an ego trip thing, right? And you're not impressing anybody like by that. In fact, you're giving everyone else stress, right? Whether you know it or not. Uh, but again, I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys know this stuff. All right, so last thing, we're right at 306. Celebrate the small wins. Okay, this is my buddy Grant right here, and he's enjoying his walk. Get it, Grant. <laughs> hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's all I got, you guys. Um, we can probably do questions for about five to ten minutes or so. If anybody, do you, Does anyone have any questions? I yes. have one. I actually live in an apartment complex, yes. so... Where would be best to train my dogs on a leash when they're not over stimulated? Yeah, so I would practice inside first. Uh, then I would practice either on the hallway or the landing in front of the door, if you can. If you can also know when things are coming. Uh, basically, I would practice progressing towards the dog park or wherever the destination would be, because that's where the dogs are going to walk all the time. You know, but I think understanding the History of the leash walking in that place is important, but not impossible, you know? So just understanding that, all right, he always pulls when we go down the stairs. So let's practice going up the stairs first, right? So your safety's involved. Um, but yeah, I would say in the house, in the hallway or whatever, space you have outside of your door, and then kind of progress to a normal walking thing, you know? Uh, but the, the good thing is the resetting techniques, they don't necessarily, um, require that much space to practice those because that's the inevitable thing we're going to need to know something like that how to bring them back without pulling uh, so you can practice those practically anywhere but that's a great question because there's a lot happening whether you have people above you or below you in your apartment is a factor too so knowing our environment is going to be important but I would say kind of outside uh, or you could drive to a, maybe an area in the complex where there may not be a lot of activity in practice there. Because um, again, it's not impossible, we just have to be reasonable about the distractions, right? Great question. Any other questions? Well, if you're out on a walk and someone is coming and that dog looks nice and all, mm -hmm. should you let the dogs 
I mean, they're both on a lead. Mm -hmm. Would you let them sniff or, so, or avoid that? Well, it's all about body language at that point, right? Recognizing if your dog is is likely to succeed in interacting with the other dog and then vice versa, you know? Uh, so there's no yes or no in that question. There's a lot of context that needs to be understood. Um, what we don't want is for them to just boom, run into each other, you know, or have the other person lead their dog into you because you're still trying to gauge the situation, right? Um, so I think in that situation, communicating with the other owner is very, is very crucial. Understanding is your dog friendly? Is is your dog, they should ask you, right? You can read the body language. I can send you guys some body language documents too to understand what we're actually reading because that's a huge part of it. Um, but I would say if both dogs look loose uh, and friendly, right? No stiffness, no tightness, no hair, no aggression, clearly, um, then I would say it's fine. But what is important is brief interactions. So if you do let your dog interact with another one that's on the leash, keep it brief and then create space and then continue your conversation. Because what happens is we'll let our dog smell, then we're talking, and we're still talking, and meanwhile our dogs are like, I've had enough of this other dog for about now, right? So if you do encounter that situation, I would keep my eyes on the dog the whole time, both dogs. Um, because it, again, it may not be your dog, it may be the other one that's saying, all right, I'm, I'm ready to get out of here. Um, so being there and recognizing that is super, super important, but communication with the other owner is important too. But you can talk to them, but watch them down there, I would say. Uh, but yeah, brief interactions, communication, and then also just um, try, to, try to ease them into the greeting without just, boom, now they're running into each other. Because that's just going to build arousal up. Right. But they may love that. But uh, also, leashes get tangled and they start leaping around your legs. And there's a lot of factors, too. But yeah, given the situation is, is set up for success, I would say it's fine for sure. But it's all about context. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, anybody else? I have one more. Yes. So I have two dogs. Yes. I know you train one separately for mm -hmm. the first and the other, but what I, how do you keep doing that training when you have both. one book? Yeah, so it becomes, it's interesting with that uh, because some of the context of these uh, techniques are different because we're not treating them both on one side. Now, um, you're totally right on about training them both individually. Uh, then, when you're walking both of them, given your environment, uh, you may not be reinforcing as much. You may not be treating as much. Um, also, depending if you like them one on each side or both on one side, because that can be a difference too. Um, so it is kind of still case by case scenario. Um, so you can definitely email me about that too. Yeah. But I would say, I would say, if you're working with each of them individually in the hopes of walking them both at the same time, uh, have that have that in mind. As far as all right, one dog can walk on this side, one on the other, or you can help them become fluent. You know, by changing sides. When I teach leash walking, uh, if somebody asks me which side should I walk my dog, you know, there's no right answer because traffic determines it, other dogs determine it. But I think as far as being a good handler goes, it's best to learn both so that way it doesn't really matter which side they're on. Same for the dog, you know. Um, but uh, if walking both dogs is the goal, I would approach it in the same way as with one dog, meaning take them to a place that's comfortable, not a lot of distractions, so you can figure out the system that works. Because it may be different for you than for someone else. Uh, some people may not mind if they're right up, just a little in front. Again, as far as leash walking goes, our goal should be to have slack in the leash, to not, to have them not pull us down a hill or into traffic, right? Uh, and also to feel comfortable and confident while we're doing it. You know, so um, I would say just setting yourself up in a place that you can practice and figure out what works best, and then you can start to modify little things, you know. Because, yeah, fluency and, and comfortability with this, uh, these exercises is really important because it feels awkward at first. You're moving one way, they're moving one way. You've got treats over here. You're not used to this leash and treats, right? Um, so there's a lot of factors. But, again, recognizing these small progress things, progress wins of your dog, whether they're looking at us, you know, 5% of the time versus never, you know, that's something, right? And it's something that's building, you know? Uh, 
as long as you recognize that, I think that can help us learn that we're going in the right direction. You know, it doesn't happen overnight, uh, though uh, you can see progress fairly quickly, but being consistent is, is really important with that. Great question. Yes? I have a five-month-old child of that. Yes. And my husband, he, is, he insists on the collar, and I don't really think the harness is the best. Yes, definitely. What do you think? Like, can I take a video? Yeah, yeah, you definitely. I'm right. Yeah, just tell me what kind of collar he's using. Just a regular collar. Just a regular one? Yeah, and I think the harness would be much more, especially if it pulls apart. Yep, definitely. So I wish I could video it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thank so, you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so as far as collars as versus as harnesses go, uh, I definitely support a harness much more because it's less stress on the neck. Uh, and also they make a lot of harnesses that you can clip on the front if pulling is a big, big issue or the back. Or this one right here, you could probably, you should definitely film this too. Because this is one of the harnesses that we love. Uh, but uh, it gives them two points of contact. None with stress on the neck. Because um, again, as far as leash walking goes, we want to reinforce them for being here. We don't want to ever pull them or force them to do anything. Uh, but definitely, I'm 100% for the harness. Um, but the idea being multiple points of contact gives us more sense of how we can redirect them versus pulling. Right? Also, if they, if they are pulling on the collar, it's still going to just jerk them in one direction. And it could lift them off the ground, it could slide it right off their neck. Uh, so security is really a big factor with that, too. Thank you. I knew I was right. Oh, you're definitely right. You're definitely right. Now, but yeah, you know what I mean? And some dogs, you know, let's be, let's, be, let's be completely open, though. Some dogs may get super rashed up from a harness, right? Or they may have some infection or some injury, or they may be a tripod and can't wear a harness. So collars, I'm not totally against collars that are not invasive, right? Uh, but um, yeah, I'm totally, totally harness advocate. Yeah, so good. You're on it. You're on it. All right, anybody else?